Uh, hey guys, and welcome to this episode of Metacast. Our guest for this episode is none other than Julie Lemieux. Uh, she's played many characters throughout Metabots uh, here and there, and has been described by our last interviewee, Joe Motiki, as, and I'm quoting here, the Meryl Streep of voice acting. <laughs> Oh, Joe, much too kind. <laughs> Very sweet of him. Uh, how you doing? Hello. Uh, I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. Uh, got a lot to live up to with the, the Meryl Streep of voice acting. Yeah, I'll say. <laughs> it's a lot. I know. Yeah, live up to that. <laughs> um, but uh, as I said in the intro there, you played quite a few different roles throughout Metabots. Um, I, I did, yeah. When you went crazy. into audition, did you audition for a specific role or was it just sweet? My initial role that I, if memory serves uh, was um, Gil Girl was the initial role I was given that I believe I auditioned for, I must have. Um, memory does not serve for that part. And then all the others followed. Um, I'm going to forget. I think I had done like 11 by the time I was into the latter part of the series. And when I, of course, got icky in season two, I was like, oh my God. Um, just, so I can't quite remember, but I know there were a lot of characters, um, but it was pretty awesome. Uh, yeah. And Gil Girl was a personal favorite because she was just so evil. <laughs> <laughs> Very fun to play. <laughs> Um, oh boy i apologize i have a crazy dog i might have to move around because he hates it when i'm on the yeah i'm moving around i'm moving around keep talking to me <laughs> it's all good um <laughs> so how did those all come about was it just uh you were there one day and they're like hey want you to do another character or what if you did this character yeah i i mean what what happens in dubbing and um part of it is monetary um, in, in terms of, you know, you can um, double up. There's a certain number of roles that you're allowed to give someone without paying, um, without necessarily, I mean, you're either paid by the line or, or by the hour, whichever is most advantageous to the actor. So there's a certain number of roles that you're allowed to double up and really you're not paying for those extra roles the way you would in regular animation. So doubling and tripling and, and 11 is, um, is very common in, in dubbing, you've probably noticed. So yes, the other, all the other roles came about. Icky was the only other role that, that I auditioned for. Um, all the other roles came about, they were just given to me. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, that's correct. When uh, just saying, okay, we're adding in this character this week. So yeah. Um, crazy fun show though. Yeah. uh you, you talk about taking up the mantle of icky there uh so metabot spirits comes around samantha reynolds uh leaves metabots and so you're saying you had to i guess audition to to pick up that role i did yeah 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 because you know it's the iconic role and i think they really wanted to make sure <laughs> and i have to admit i was like i already had so many parts i was like well, I don't think I'm going to get this. What I did, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> um, those were like really intense sessions, some of them with uh, playing multiple you know, roles in a session. I, I love it. <laughs> did you... So yeah, I was shocked when I got it. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you roll from character to character or did you try and record like all Icky's lines and then all the next character's lines and then all the next ones? That's correct. Mm. So we'd go from one to the, uh, like, all of one character's lines and then moving on to the next how how long do those sessions end up if you are recording like 11 characters it sounds like they could be strangely i mean uh, dubbing really motors uh my recollection is probably the longest of those sessions might have been like three and a half hours but for the most part under three i mean they you motor <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh you get go through a lot of material in a short amount of time yeah just uh, mm -hmm. hair in the beeps and just going for it. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we worked on uh, three beeps. Uh, I'm sure you know that already. Um, yeah. Um, with with Icky coming into the fold, did you 
try to replicate the voice that Icky had previously, or were you just trying to do your own thing and separate the character a little bit? No, they had asked us. They wanted someone who could as closely as possible match Samantha's read. Um, so that was the added complication to that was that I literally had to do my best to, I watched a lot of, uh, a, a lot of episodes of, um, of, uh, Samantha's work, but I, Samantha has an incredibly, uh, uh, different than what I do, a young boy read. It's really, there's a real, I don't know how to, it's slot, there's a kind of, a, <laughs> I don't know how to say it, it kind of. It's slippery. There's a and and very authentic. And mine was less like I, I had a hard time replicating that. The, I don't even know that you know what I mean, but that's how I describe yeah. it. It slides around a lot. I had a hard time replicating that, but I did. Um, uh, I, I'll call it. I felt like I needed to go left of center, like just throw things out in order to get close to Samantha's read. I, I, I don't know if that makes any sense whatsoever, <laughs> but it wasn't an, it wasn't like, oh, I got that. It wasn't an easy match for me um, at all. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned Gil Girl as like a favorite character. Do you have any moments from episodes that you remember or, or scenes or just fun lines um, that you can look back on? I wish I could tell you that. <laughs> I just know that some of the the fun stuff between, and I'm forgetting, uh, Squid Guts and uh, who was the third now? <laughs> uh, just the, the, like the Three Stooges, right? Yeah. The, uh, just the, the rapport between the three. And of course we never recorded together. Mm. Um, I'm often, I was in first and didn't even hear their dialogue, but it was just a fun, they were just such a, they were just such a <laughs> dumb fun. And I guess Gil Girl being the smartest of the trio, uh, just a fun thing to do. Um, I know she had some signature lines and I'm letting you down because I can't remember them. I just, I just love, I've always loved and actually it's strange because I've made my bulk of my career playing good, good gals and guys. Uh, but I love playing evil characters just because, you know, you can really, it's not something you live with every day. Well, I don't anyway, yeah. every day. So it's like going outside of my, um, uh, my everyday normal range of emotions and really, and you can really push it, you know, and, uh, and have fun with it. Hmm. I've heard that from a couple people now, just the being able to, go out there and just express however you want with the villain um mm -hmm. bit of an added bonus it is um so also in metabots you you voice characters uh without mouths in terms of the robots and uh <laughs> the human characters uh for, for dubbing where you'd normally have to match the mouth flaps did you ever approach these characters differently uh in terms of not having to worry about mouth flaps for characters without mouths <laughs> Well, those are the, from, from a technical perspective, those are the easiest characters, right? Because all you need to match is in intro and extra. Like you just have to get the ins and outs uh, in terms of the length of the line. And the rest, I mean, you can just play. You can play a lot more uh, because you're not you literally. So if you want to change the performance somewhat and make it, I don't know, let's just say a sing-songy character or, or something more robotic or, whatever it might be, yeah. you're not linked to the performance of the uh, of the Japanese performers where they laid it down. Where, so once you've got lip flaps, you can be creative, but if it doesn't land, it doesn't land, right? There's, you've got to do it over. Um, so you've got much, it's a little harder. And um, at the same time though, lip flaps, you know, we're used to seeing people's mouths moves and they give us, they give us a clear indicator of emotion, right? Which you don't get with the other characters. So you're, uh, of course you get with the, uh, the, the little arrows and things that come out, that's your indicator with the characters that have no mouth. So, um, but not quite, not as simple. Um, and I'm simple. I mean, I like, you know what I mean? Like there's something about, obviously when you've got lip flaps, you know, when the mouth goes huge that you're like freaking out. Um, Whereas it's not as abundantly obvious uh, with, you know, with the characters without a mouth. 
But having said that, you've got full liberty with those characters. So it's pretty cool. We we switch tack entirely and we look at, I guess, original cartoon uh, stuff. We've, you've got no lip flaps anymore. Uh, you're just recording lines. How does that style differentiate with, with dubbing, I guess, or do you have a preference between the two? You mean dubbing in original animation? Yeah. That, yes. Well, um, I'm very visual. So, and, and I spent most of my career, actually, I'd say the bulk of, I've been doing animation for 30 years now. So the bulk of my career has been doing original animation. Hmm. So uh, where really, you have to really bring it your imagination is everything because literally often you're working alone. There's just you and the script. And um, so working on dubbing is a joy because literally uh, it's like being a kid again and you just react and you know, you're splitting your focus between the script and the, and the visual, but the visual gives you everything you need to know. So it's, and sometimes what I love about it is I've, created some characters where I went in a direction thinking they're never going to cast me just doing something odd and they did and it fits even though it may not have been what was done in the Japanese or it may not have been what the majority of people sometimes I like just doing something weird (laughs) (laughs) Um, because you can you've got the visual and you're like oh that might fit Um, so you can take bigger risks in a sense, um, I find anyway. And and it's an immediate hit because you've got it in front of you as opposed to you really have to, you have to bring it 100% when you're doing original animation. It's all on you, right? I mean, obviously you've got a team behind you who are going yes, no, maybe like the writers, the uh, the director, the, uh, the, the, the voice director, all that. Um, but, um, but in order to get an audition or book, like you, you're working straight. Just sometimes you don't even have a picture. Sometimes all you have is the script, um, or even then you don't even have the script. You just have a so, so select pieces of the sides that have been pulled out. So here it's very when you're auditioning for anime, you're auditioning for picture. When you're working to it, uh, obviously, and there's something very visceral, very you know you don't immediately you you get a very strong hit. And usually that hit is the right way to go. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that three decades of voice acting. It's a, a an amazingly long career. As and I'm 12. It's amazing. <laughs> it, you started when you were negative 18. Nobody could have seen it coming. <laughs> Good math. <laughs> <laughs> I, we're lucky I got that. I don't usually get the math right. <laughs> um, but I guess if we look... Uh, all the way back to the start of your career and we look at now what's changed the most in this voice acting world well uh let's start with dubbing i mean when i what the first time i worked uh on dubbing was with what they call a rhythmo band um i don't even know if that makes any sense to you but literally where the the script was detected that's the word uh onto a band like like the person would have to literally move the band along and put all the <laughs> script on it. Now that was an incredibly easy way to dub because like literally it was written out. And so if you're screaming, the E would be like huge. Now we were, uh, then I went from that to just the three beeps and that's what Metabots was, three beeps and a script. So the, you know, you've got, you're literally much harder splitting your t- um, your focus between the script that's on a lectern and the visual that's over here. Nowadays, it's more like what I call uh, karaoke dubbing, um, in that you've got you know the, all these like systems like uh, I'm not going to name one because I'm going to get the name wrong. But there's a whole bunch of the yeah. uh, dubbing systems now, and uh, much easier on the eye because you've literally got, you know, and it, and it, it changes from like the color to let you know you're up in three, you know, and then it goes green and you just, it's literally like karaoke. You just follow the, the green <laughs> um, from when the yellow goes to green, you just follow it along and, and you've got the visual right above it. So that I find is 
again, being highly visual, really easy. That's a huge uh, change in, in anime. In animation itself, what has changed? Uh, well, animation has changed, definitely. How, you know, from uh, anim when I started, they were still animating with cells. Um, Yes, I'm that old. Frightening. And uh, oh, no, you're 12. We've established 12. this. Sorry, sorry, you're right. I forgot. And uh, and now, of course, you know, you've gone from CGI to 3D and all that. Um, from our perspective, I mean, the types of characters, the not much changes really. I'd say in a voice actor's world, you know, we have a script on a lectern, <laughs> and uh, we're in a studio or now uh, during COVID. I'm in my closet, literally. Um, we've all had to work from our home studios, largely. Um, so that's strange. Um, uh, if we're, if you're lucky enough to have a home studio, if you're not, that makes it difficult. But um, you know, the types of you know, I, I find the the biggest thing, the types of shows that get made are, you know, that shifts, right? They'll be like cop shows or all of a sudden dog shows or <laughs> yeah and then there'll be a bunch of them like the show the this show that i did a show this last year this year yeah both years <laughs> that just aired this year called doomsday brothers and at the same time there was another show another doomsday show auditioning and i was like oh two doomsday shows at the same time um so it's funny how that happens it's almost like i don't know if it's because I'm not involved in that side of it. I don't pitch shows or write shows. Um, you know, I, I, it's almost like someone goes, we need we need a doomsday show. And then there's a bunch of them. So, it, you know, everything ebbs and flows in that way. But the um, my job hasn't really changed that much in 30 years. I do, uh, I, I still work on paper, you know, I because that way I can, uh, I mean, I hope some people, might work on an iPad or, but I like writing notes and arrows and things so that I can, uh, so that, you know, it, it lifts off the page uh, and um, my eye goes straight to it when, you know, all the little notes I write myself, as I said, highly visual. Yeah. So, but not much has changed for us. Uh, except obviously with the, the COVID era coming about and uh, <laughs> shifting changed. everything uh, to home. Uh, mm -hmm. how how easily were you able to i guess just pick it up and run with it from a home studio for for most of your voice acting <laughs> jobs that's a lovely question not <laughs> i um so over the years i've always wanted to have a home studio i actually had one very uh poor i had a really great uh equipment i just didn't have a soundproof room and so I decided literally that I, uh, and I, look, I'm, I'm going to take you there so okay. you can see it. Um, I decided that the best way for me to do this was simply to use the smallest space possible to make this happen. Ergo, I'm in my closet. So <laughs> it is literally half my closet here in my office and uh, it works. That's yeah. because I just baffled the sound. So once I got over my stubbornness, and then also got over my, I'm not technical. I had a couple of panic attacks. Um, it was good. <laughs> only a couple. <laughs> only a couple. Truly only a couple, which I guess I'm, I should be grateful for. So it's true that you can teach an old dog new tricks, even if they're 12. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know what 12 is in dog years. I don't have that conversion uh, in front of me. 12 is, I don't know. <laughs> um, outside of Metabots, you've done there's so many shows. Like if you look at behind the voice actors, your page just scrolls and scrolls. Um, do you have a, a particularly favorite role that you've done or a favorite show that you've worked on? Well, my heart always will belong to Rupert because it was my first, uh, big role uh not my first big it was my first role uh mm -hmm. other than i did chang and tintin that's something that's changed i would never even get to audition for that role today rightly so mm -hmm. um uh that, you know 
we'll leave that there. Um, that was my first role. And then shortly thereafter, I got uh, Rupert, um, which was for me like a dream come true doing. I, and that show was done ensemble and I worked with some amazing, I, so I like, I learned to hone my craft on that show, working ensemble and watching people work uh, as a newbie and uh, you know, having to be literally, I was the straight man as Rupert and everyone else was like crazy and just learning to just keep that line, keep that line. It was a good line and not, and let them have the laughs. And, uh, but just, it was, um, it was magical for me. And the show itself is absolutely very true to uh, the original uh, strip. So it's, uh, it's stunningly beautiful. So that, my heart belongs to Rupert, I must say. Um, but I've done, God, I have been so blessed in my career. And I'm not saying it's over. I'm only 12. <laughs> um, like literally, I've done so many amazing, you know, icon, like roles on iconic preschool shows like um, Max and Ruby and Paw Patrol and... Um, uh, Come on, Julie. Uh, Arthur, um, Richard Scary, you know, uh, B Busy Town Mysteries, um, all kinds of stuff. Um, and, you know, doing shows for every age group, every, every, I've played ba from babies to 80 year old women. How, how lucky am I that I've had that kind of a range? Um, love playing uh, guys um, because, again, I'm not one. So it's always, I grew up with two brothers, so came very easily to me. <laughs> uh, they're, they've been my inspiration, you know, for uh, all of my younger male characters. Um, yeah, I, I honestly, I have so many series that I've been so fortunate to work on, but for me, Rupert is mine. My, my, will always be my number one, literally. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so now you talk about being a, a newbie back with Rupert and now you walk into a recording studio, maybe with some other people pre COVID, uh, and now you're there with the 30 years experience on, you're on the other side of the coin. Um, do, do people, I guess, ask for advice or like, Hey, how was that? Um, in the, in the recording booth and stuff like that? Um, not well, I, I guess I have had some people ask certain things in the recording booth, but mostly outside. Like I will have people um, ask if they can, you know, have a conversation. And I'm more, always more than, um, I'm, I was too shy to do that. And when I was young, I just, I was like a sponge, but I really was too shy to go to someone and say, hey, <laughs> <laughs> Never even occurred to me. I really was very shy, but I, so I'm very happy to do that because we, we don't, you know, as, as actors, we often work in isolation, but we don't, we're part of a team. We're part of a much larger team. And, uh, an actor's work is often, uh, even a voice actors, um, you know, there's a lot of insecurity because you really don't know when you do something. Did it land? Did you, you know, our audience is even liking it? I mean, you eventually, if you're strong enough in <laughs> spirit to go on some <laughs> sites and want to troll and look, I can't do that. I'm, I'm a softie. So I just, I, I hope that people enjoy my work. And if not, well, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, but, but I'm always, I, I, I really um, believe that, you know, it takes a village and we are all here to help each other out. And and even though um, because of the weirdness of my career, I might audition up against a 22 year old actor. I'm, I never feel that I'm, uh, well, it would make me not a very kind person to just go, you know what, I'm just not going to share any of the knowledge I've gained in these 30 <laughs> years with you, so. Yeah. Um, if there's any other, uh, fellow 12 year olds out there, maybe looking at getting into voice acting in uh, six or eight years when their <laughs> voice cracks and settles, uh, <laughs> do you have any, uh, tips for them or any sort of advice just for the general audience? Yeah. 
Well, I mean, the most obvious is if you want to, I, I mean, this is my world, so I'm not even going to talk about commercials or anything else because this is my baby, is animation. Um, it's so I, I like to talk about what I know. Um, the, the obvious is if this jazz, if this is what you want to do, well, you like any other field of study, you study. So watch animation, number one, watch it, watch all the archetypes, the stereotypes, the, and then decide when it's appropriate. When might it be appropriate to break it? Like look at a character and go, what if that role had been played opposite to what it was done? And what would that look like? What would that sound like? Um, because in casting, when they choose one person, I mean, uh, you know, especially roles that become really, really iconic, it's hard to imagine that there were another 700 people maybe auditioning for that. And I'm sure there were other, other choices that came very close and they might've been very weirdly different. So it's all, doing animation is all about broadening your um, imagination because it all lives in here because that world is the is the opposite of COVID-19 is mm -hmm. <laughs> a world where everyone is free where your only limit is your imagination mm -hmm. your physical body does not limit you your even your voice your voice box maybe to some extent but you can move your voice around in your body right you can use a head voice a chest voice and put texture on it you can there's so many things you can do you know in, and then go into performance and soften scream so that not everything is the same look for the peaks and valleys so to do all that number one you've got to know thyself <laughs> you've got to know your own instrument so you've got to watch cartoons you've got to um start to learn what you sound like um i grew up like a crazy person. <laughs> I I didn't even realize I did this, but I gave everything a voice. I give my dog a voice. I give everything. And I made sound effects all the time. Um, you know, like I just like open a door and go, Brr. I didn't even realize I did it. It's just <laughs> the way I am. And I've not been hospitalized for it. I actually been paid for it. So it's amazing. So that whatever weird thing you've got, this is the gig where you can use it. And I don't mean, you know, I just mean if you, so do you do sound effects? Can you, do you accents? Um, uh, again, can you switch genders, do children's voices, explore the range of what you've got. And uh, if you have a microphone at home, do it in front of a microphone with headphones on because it's very subtle work and it's amazing. You have to hear yourself to, because often they will say, that's great, but that's eight. Can you make it nine? <laughs> <laughs> and so to do that, you know, you have to really know, well, first of all, again, that's very subjective. Their nine might not be my nine, but because, <laughs> you know, I'm 12, but the, uh, but you really, I see it on, as on a, being on a scale in a sense. And mm. so, God, it's hard to describe, but the notes. So I just go up a notch in, in age, whatever that means. Might be adding a bit of texture, might be adding a little attitude. So it's a real combo of technical skill with your body and your vo vocal box and, and acting chops. That's so also... Take an acting class, uh, take an improv class. Uh, those would be my recommends. Cool. And uh, just as we're reaching the end here, um, I don't know if you've remembered any more projects that you can speak about, but uh, <laughs> we, we were talking about Doomsday Brothers, uh, huh? new season of Bakugan, uh, anything else that you're, you're working on that you uh, Snoopy in space. She's on Apple TV and the Snoopy show. Um, <laughs> what else? Uh, wow. Isn't that great? Uh, Charlie and the Coliform Cities. Yeah. Charlie and the Coliform. Sorry. They changed the name. And um, uh, did season one of um, a new reboot of Clifford the Big Red Dog. Uh, so that was fun. 
and I'm drawing a blank as to all the other things I've done. My my apologies. I'm very good at that. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure there's no executives watching this going, she didn't mention our show. <laughs> Whoops. If so, my apologies. <laughs> uh, uh, thanks a lot for taking time out of your day to have a chat today. Great. It's been a pleasure. Nice meeting you. And uh, thanks for having me on your podcast. Cheers.